topic today for forum is Quakers and Easter, um, which um, I'm not sure if you guys had a chance to see um, just very fortuitously Friends uh, Journal published an article uh, by more or less that same name. Um, I think it might have been one or two words different uh, just a day or two ago. Mm -hmm. um, which I was uh, very grateful for since um, uh, originally Howard had been um, scheduled to lead this forum, um, but he is actually needed to clerk uh, at South Center in the early meeting. So um, I was mm -hmm. a little bit at a loss for uh, what to do there. Um, and um, I guess basically what the article said was that, um, I guess as you may know, Quakers uh, historically, and I think to this present day, um, don't really uh, follow the liturgical year. Um, so um, we don't, the idea is that all days are sacred and that the idea that some, some days are more sacred than others um, is um, misleading. Um, and that, um, furthermore, uh, especially for early friends, um, there was a, I think, awareness that uh, these days were uh, somewhat arbitrarily picked and suspiciously close to pagan holidays, um, so that there was <laughs> this concern that these were, in fact, not uh, legitimate Christian holidays, and that rather um, uh, we should just sort of ignore them and treat every day. And then you see that in the um, the way in which Quakers have um, marked time, um, that they got to the, even the further extreme of not even, beyond not even acknowledging the uh, liturgical year, uh, not even wanting to use the days of the week, for instance, and saying sort of first day, second day, third day, um, and um, wanting to, uh, yeah, first month even, second month, all of that. Um, so I guess, the first sort of question I have is uh, just about time and about uh, sacredness of um, time. Um, I guess I, I at least in myself feel myself sort of pulled in two directions with that. Um, on the one hand, um, I do think that they're, yeah, they're probably right that there is quite a degree of arbitrariness to the way these dates were picked or that, well, maybe not arbitrariness, but historical facts that are not particularly religious in their nature led to these particular dates being um, selected. Um, it maybe would make much more sense just to time Easter um, in accordance with the Jewish Passover, um, because of that's sort of where that context originally came from. Um, and that the idea that every day is sacred, I find that really beautiful. Um, however, I also find the passage of time beautiful and marking difference within the year and um, that there's something about shifting in the seasons and um, marking out particular days that resonates with me. Um, and I guess I, I'm just curious how all of you feel about time and about days and about holidays and marking out days as special or different from each other. Um, is that something that has spiritual meaning in your life or is it more the case that every day really is equally sacred? You know, I, I think, I think perhaps it's a combination of the two, perhaps, you know, when I think of special days, I also think of, of the, the, personal nature, uh, say the family time that you might have around Thanksgiving or Christmas um, and birthdays, you know, so in some ways an acknowledgement of, of something that is special that is in fact associated with that day doesn't, doesn't, I won't say bother me, I'm glad for it. That's something that's important, but you know, as far as there, there being an extra spiritual aspect to a day and maybe maybe a little harder uh, for me to, to think of the holidays in that way Easter you know it, it certainly it is a time perhaps of awakening of renewal um, but um, you know I'm not sure that I draw any significant 
you know, spiritual thought from the day itself, other, other than any other day. I'm kind of ambivalent about it too. It's sort of like these teen, it's, uh, I feel like these uh, different times need to be acknowledged in some way or another, you know, like, uh, and, uh, you know, um, but I'm not sure how. And uh, it's certainly, as you said, that the dates are arbitrary. Um, so uh, I don't think we do really well to, uh, to make the day itself such a big deal, you know, like, um, but one thing I can't help uh, wondering about is, uh, had it not been a Palm Sunday, if Jesus had come into uh, Jerusalem in a different way, what would have happened to Quakerism? Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, how would how would uh, James uh, James Naylor? Yeah, how would he have walked into? Um, uh, oh gosh, I'm having trouble remembering things. Uh, the town uh, uh, Bristol. Bristol. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, well, and it, it would have profoundly affected the the, uh, the future of Quakerism. He, Done something else, you know. <laughs> That's true. And did he do that? Did he actually did that on Palm Sunday? Did did he? I'm, I'm not sure of the history there. I'm not sure really, because I think uh, I read somewhere that he had done something similar a few weeks before, but nobody paid any attention to it. <laughs> it's, I've got to go back and read that. That's interesting to think that even though um, I, for the most part, Quakers nowadays and back then, um, actually, yeah, I hadn't thought about that much, Mitch. Um, there's sort of a, not much emphasis on sort of the theatricality of reenacting the Christ story in most of contemporary Quakerism, the way you, um, other Christian traditions really um, experience that and use that very much in, in their practice, uh, this sort of reenactment and reliving different stages um, of the, the, Christ, the Christ story. Um, except I guess in that very first early moment of Quakerism, there's this very dramatic reenactment of the entry into Jerusalem that that sort of, um, I wonder if that react, rejection of the James Naylor side of things sort of was uh, why why we ended up so uh, resist or hesitant about uh, theatrical reenactment or um, being too um, expressive in our our uh, telling and understanding of the the story. Interesting. I guess for any oh Terry Glenna yeah oh um, I actually agree with everything that you all have said. Um, I, the following the calendar, uh, the Christian calendar is is a, can be a tool to be more devout um, if you look at it that way. Um, and um, <clears throat> I haven't actually, uh, but I but I could I could read more on any day. And I, I hope to now that I'm retired, um, and uh, go that go that direction. But I remember Martin Luther King on the day that we celebrate him. Um, and I 
have books of his writings that I want to read. Mm. I guess that's true. Yeah, maybe just these days as reminders mm -hmm. to. Yeah. Another thing that sometimes appeals to me is, in addition to reminding us to read or, or think about certain things, um, that especially sort of Holy Week has um, a variety of religious emotions mm -hmm. embedded in each of the days. Um, that Easter is, of course, this like burst of joy and celebration, um, but then you also have um, Good Friday, sort of the the crucifixion and Easter vigil and these sort of times that are meant to be um, more somber and um, sort of periods of sadness and worry. Um, and that those, by sort of taking us through different points mm -hmm. in an emotional arc, um, mm -hmm. I think there's something valuable to that. Um, and I, I'm not sure how, I mean, do we find that sort of, I guess, do I, I feel like do, do those emotions just sort of crop up naturally at different times within Quakerism when we don't have it's sort of laid out quite like that. I um, wonder what your experience is there. You know, it, it sometimes, you know, there was a, a period in my life and pre-teens that, that uh, was going to the the Episcopalian church and, and uh, catechism and all of that. And, and I know at the time that the, uh, the structure of that was, it, it felt like it was, it was reassuring. It felt uh, like there was a path that, that made sense. And, but I'm, you know, that, you know, so I don't negate that in any form or fashion. I mean, there's, there's a, there's a, uh, there are many people who find that reassuring and, and, and necessary. Um, and I think, I think the attraction to me to Quakerism is, is really kind of a release of that. And, uh, and, uh, you know, more towards the, you know, the thought, as you said, James, earlier, that each day and each person you meet in each day is, is special. So, but yet there is still a part of that. And I, I, I'm, I am kind of curious, the more conservative friends, uh, say the North, North Carolina friends that are more conservative, uh, ecumenically, perhaps, what might they here at meeting today, you know, that I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't either. I transitioned the other, so the other part of the article that was in Friends Journal, so it sort of had two, two main points. I mean, the first one was just that there was this deep, um, this uh, resistance to the liturgical year and to the sort of traditional church calendar. Um, but the other side of that is that um, the resurrection and the story of Jesus was very, very important to their early friends, mm -hmm. um, and that this is something that they, rather than, um, you know, doing once a year, they really thought should be always with us. Um, and uh, so um, I guess uh, one thing I was uh, thinking of doing now is just taking a moment um, and, you know, I'm sorry, Howard's not with us since he, he brings such uh, deep knowledge of uh, the gospel and of the Bible story with him, um, which I, I don't really have. Um, but I guess um, I'm going to just put a little bit of um, the story of uh, the resurrection into the chat real quick. Um, okay. So uh, let's see, did that work? Let me just make sure. Oh, it did not. Um, 
So this R, the first part of um, the resurrection of uh, Jesus. If someone, can everybody see that in the chat? I can. Great. Um, cool. Yeah. Uh, would, would somebody mind uh, just reading that first sort of paragraph there? Uh, the resurrection of Jesus. Oh, okay. Verse 20. Uh, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and, other, and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, um, but, but the other disciple ran, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look, to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not, um, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Thanks, Glenda. Cool, let me put the next little bit in there. Um, for some reason, I didn't copy all of that. Mm. Um, oh, and the last part of that little uh, paragraph is, uh, then the disciples return to their homes. Mm. Um, okay. So here's the next, so they return to their homes, um, and then here's the next uh, bit, which is about uh, Mary Magdalene, I hope. Um, would somebody else be willing to read uh, the Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene? I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. Um, <clears throat> Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, I ha they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father. Oh, sorry. For some reason, uh, it always cuts off a little bit at the end. Um, let me get that for you real quick. Um, uh, to your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them, that he had said these things to her. So this one is from the Gospel of John, and, and the other the other Gospels have slightly different um, accounts of um, that sort of moment on that Easter Sunday when they uh, first found the empty tomb. Um, and I guess just reading that story, is there anything that uh, jumps out to anyone? 
I think it's interesting that uh, I don't know what to make of it, but um, they are uh, the um, the apostles and the disciples are um, and Mary uh, they don't recognize him at first, and it kind of makes me wonder what sort of uh, <laughs> you know what what sort of um, incarnation uh, <laughs> is he at this point, you know? Uh, how, why, um, okay. what does he look like? <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mitch. That's exactly the same thing, question that jumped out to me as well. Um, yeah, does anybody have any thoughts or answers there? I, I Googled it briefly. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> Uh, some years ago, um, go, entering Polunsky to visit death row inmates, um, I walked in with a couple, a man and a woman holding hands, and they were so joyful. Uh, it, and they looked really young to me, but when you're really happy, you look younger. Uh, but, um, we were talking some and they told me that their son was on death row. And it was sort of hard to figure out those two, that the image of them being so happy. Um, and then over time, I would see them uh, as over the few years uh, during that time frame, as we both entered. And then one day we were sitting in the visiting room um, next to each other, both waiting for the guards to bring our visitor, our prison visitors down. And um, uh, it was uh, Mr. Schamberger. Uh, the father said to me, he's got seven days left and he's ready to go. And I his, the son's name was Ron, Ron Schamberger. Um, and he, he was extremely Christ-centered, very devout, very, very devout, uh, impressive, really impressively so. Um, I told Mr. and Mrs. Schamberger that when there was an execution in Austin, there was a prayer protest vigil at that time um, at the governor's mansion. It was back then there. And that I would be there at that time. And um, I'd, I'd, I'd attended others, um, but um, so I stood there praying that God would be with Ron, please be with Ron. Please be with Ron. You must be with Ron. And then I realized, I don't even know what I'm doing. I can't tell God what to do. And I just gave up. Um, and I had a vision. I was, my head, head was down looking at the pavement, but on the pavement was a vision. It, it's, um, uh, now I can't think of the word, you know, if you, your credit card, you move it, the squiggly. Um, like a hologram kind of thing? Yes, thank you. That's the word, yeah. I, I should have had this written down. But yeah, it was a hologram and um, I saw uh, a being with long hair, long straight, straight hair, um, I just saw the silhouette and uh, he was wearing sandals and uh, as he got up, I mean his foot raised and then he stood up on both feet uh, and there was a being beside him on the other side. Um, and that, that's the most beautiful thing. I've ever seen. I, I never thought of a movement 
as being that beautiful. It was so fluid. And as he stood up, his head, I mean, he was like this anyway, but his head went like that and I was over here. Um, and I believe that that was Jesus walking him into the execution chamber. Mm -hmm. uh, and that my wish, well, you know, I, I got to see that. Um, so I wonder, as, as we were talking about uh, what, he, what Jesus must have looked like, I wondered if it was like a hologram. Um, anyway, I, I wrote the family and told them about that. And um, they had some connection in South America. Um, and they had been on a trip and they had circulated uh, Ron's statement. He, he wrote a booklet about Jesus and they had that translated into Spanish. Uh, and uh, shared, shared that all over. Um, and, you know, they were really sad and, but uh, they had recently had a birth in the family and that was happy. And, you know, I mean, that it's really important to me. And um, I realized when I gave my spiritual journey, I did not even bring that up. Um, which um, I should have, and um, you know, and I will if I ever get another chance. Thank you for sharing that, Glenna. That was very nice. And I, I wonder too, if not being able to recognize Jesus in this case, and there's other parts uh, in subsequent parts of the story where he's initially not recognized if that if that doesn't make a lot of sense i mean um you know certainly the idea that our spirit lives on and is holy doesn't mean that it's recognizable in a physical form mm -hmm. and uh so it's it's uh, thank you again for sharing that story very very good you're welcome Thank you. It's a good day to share that, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've never had an experience like that, Glenna. I really appreciate hearing that about that. I, yeah, I wonder, I, I guess, where this sort of takes my mind at least is um, reading that. Um, I guess I, I've sort of had trouble throughout my life knowing who Jesus is or what, if I could recognize, and I, I feel like especially the way Quakers understand Jesus um, in this sort of inward experience, um, like that, that George Fox saying, um, you know, there is one even Christ Jesus that can speak to that condition, that that sort of, that inner relationship to Jesus is so central. Um, and whether I can even recognize him or whether I, I would be able to recognize him if he were to, be, if he is in my life and present there, um, I, I, I wonder how, how I would see how I would recognize whether it would be sort of a um, and I guess one thing from that story too is she doesn't recognize him until he calls to her um, and says Mary and then, then she when she hears his voice then, then she recognizes him and um, I wonder if that's the same thing for the friends for George Fox like at that sort of that little quote there is one even Christ Jesus um, that can speak to thy condition um, that's not something that George Fox is necessarily saying it's something he actually he heard in his that that was something that was coming to him um, 
and that that sort of being called to um yeah I don't know but then again I, I've never experienced something quite like that like I've never heard something or seen something in the way that you did The, the Schambergers had, uh, they were uh, faithful attenders, members of their church, and they had a support committee in the church. Uh, and uh, I met one of the members of the support committee who was also coming in to visit him. Uh, and uh, it was at a point that they were trying to decide whether they should um, view the execution. I, I assume they probably did, but I don't know. But she, she shared that with me that, and that, that was really nice. I mean, that's, that's really personal. Um, and, uh, so, I mean, after Ron was imprisoned, he was really, uh, you know, he was really open about the motivation for what happened and how uh, he was fo focusing on the wrong things and uh, his, you know, they, he had a modest, uh, I mean, they weren't, they weren't wealthy or probably even middle class. Um, and he said, I really, I had everything I needed. I didn't need to steal some, you know, and then kill because he was caught. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, I, I think, his, I hope his message, Ron's message met uh, the hearts of others, young people that would be really especially helpful. I wonder, do you know if that book is something that the meeting could maybe have a copy of, or is it something that's still out there? That he wrote? Mm -hmm. I have it somewhere in my papers. And um, I could uh, I could share it when I find it. Uh, I've got pockets of records that are perfectly organized. And then another somewhat duplicate <laughs> someplace else with other things in it, you know, and uh, I, I have um, a lot of uh, resources, Quaker resources that I'm going to bring eventually to the meeting. Um, but uh, I um, now that I'm retired, uh, one would think that I have all this time, but um, I've lived in this house like for 40 years and never had to move. Uh, and I love books uh, and I bought plenty and plenty again. And then when I worked um, at the seminary, I had an office that was really large and I, I got it because no one was in it. <laughs> I, I didn't have the status to have such a large office, but it had bookshelves. So I had an office filled with books there. And then when I retired, I had to get all the books back here with the ones I already had. And my daughter-in-law and my son live with me now. And my daughter-in-law has a lot of books. 
Uh, and my son has some, but he has lots of recordings. And so we put all of our, we're all living together and we brought three households together and her mom retired. We have her furniture. It, it, it's epic um, doing this. And, and I'm finding things that are wonderful. I mean, it's, it's a joy when I'm not depressed about it. Uh, but uh, anyway, I'm trying. I'm, 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 I'm connected to the meeting. I'm, I'm here forever. Um, but I'm trying to just a, attend to things that I won't have any more duties to do for a while. Uh, except anything that has to do with death row visitation. I'm, I'm in with that. And so for sure. Uh, so I'm going to peace and social concerns committee. Uh, but uh, so I kind of just have my toes in the water right now in, in a way, but my heart is there and true. Yeah, I, I love, I just, um, I mostly have since I just, I love to hear that, uh, yeah, the writing on someone who deeply felt and connected with Jesus. Yeah. What, what his words yeah. would be like. Yeah, especially in that. Um, it's always, and one reason I, I worry that I might not recognize is, um, I guess I grew up in a very, um, very secular household and environment where um, if Jesus was mentioned, it was mostly in sort of a more sarcastic way um, that was, uh, you know, um, it, he, he was sort of a, a symbol of the, um, the opposing side um, mm -hmm. that that was. Uh, um, and so it's, um, yeah, I, I just being able to connect with the name of Jesus or some inexperience that has mm -hmm. any of that imagery or language around it. Um, it's just something that um, I, 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 I don't know that I have been able to do that yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be glad to share that. I don't guarantee when that will be. But, um, I will definitely do that. I wonder if the if Mary Magdalene's inability to recognize uh, Christ at the time as well doesn't fall nicely into the idea that perhaps perhaps God isn't always recognizable in those we meet, even though we know that God dwells in each. And so somebody may come up to you and, I, uh, and, and say something or do something that becomes meaningful in a way, perhaps that they didn't even know it. And it becomes, and it speaks to you. And, and certainly those types of experiences, you know, after sitting down, thinking about it, you know, those, those can occur perhaps far less dramatically, but, but yet, you know, is, is not recognizing Jesus when you're, when he's standing next to you, but, but yet they're, they're meaningful in, in guiding your life and in, in, in the path that you choose. And sometimes we see the holiness in another. And that is so wonderful. And a meeting, that, that happens for me in a meeting. I really value the people that we worship with.
Thank you. Yeah, I feel like Chip, you're articulating. I feel like that was where my heart and mind were going with reading this in terms of trying to understand what it meant when she didn't recognize him right away. And you put that really, really beautifully. Um, and I did, I sort of just, I was just curious what the internet would say about this. So I um, <laughs> just <laughs> Googled, why, why did not, why didn't Mary Magdalene, you know, recognize Jesus right away? Um, and a lot of the initial first responses that sort of popped up were actually, I mean, mostly people who their goal was to sort of refute skeptics of it that said, oh, because she didn't recognize him right away, he didn't, he wasn't actually resurrected, it was somebody else. Um, and, and of course, those, those answers tend towards, um, you know, it was too dark out, or she didn't look long enough, or she was crying, so she couldn't, sort of very uh, material explanations of why she was unable to recognize him in that moment um, as sort of justification that it really was him and that she, that this is, there's a very good explanation for this. Um, but I think what you're saying in that, that that explanation, I feel like is a, has a much deeper spiritual truth to it. And I think, I feel like that's truer to this, why why she's not able to recognize, especially also since I think it might have been, it's the Gospel of Luke where on the road to Emo, I believe, um, that the disciples also don't recognize Jesus. Um, mm. That there's that, that we don't always recognize mm. Christ in the world um, and in, in other people. Mm. No, especially especially those who either don't look, think, or believe the same as us. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think ultimately if we can get there as a species, you know, that's where we'll, we'll make some advancement. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps that should be the goal. Mm -hmm. Too though, I, some something that just just occurred to me now in the George Fox passage where he um, talks about uh, uh, you know there is one even Christ Jesus that can speak to that condition. Um, it's when he's realizing that all the other people he's been trying to listen to and go to are not he can't rely on them that they do, they don't speak yeah. to him. Um, so in a way, it's also an, a learning. Uh, for him at least, who not, not to listen to or not to try to follow along with. That was, uh, and to sort of have a more sort of inward experience that that's um, the uh, crucial thing. Actually, I, I have that little um, passage since it was sort of yeah. um, here, if, if we wanna just look at that real quick in these last few minutes. Um, hopefully this will all paste into the um, chat this time. Let's see. Um, Okay, I'll need to. The, the last little bit of it there. I guess maybe I'll, I'll just read that real quick for the, the, the benefit of those who are joining us via recording, if one should wait that so that they're not. Um, so uh, this is from the Journal of George Fox. Uh, now, after I have received that opening from the Lord, that to be bred at Oxford or Cambridge was not sufficient to fit a man to be a minister of Christ, I regarded the priests less and looked more after the dissenting people. As I had forsaken all the priests, though I left the separate preachers also, and those called the most experienced people, for I saw there was none among them all that could speak to my condition. And when all my hopes in them and in all men were gone, so that I had nothing outwardly to help me, nor could tell what to do and oh then i uh, i heard a voice which said there is one even christ jesus who can speak to thy condition 
And when I heard in my heart and did leap for joy, uh, it my heart did leap for joy. Then the Lord did let me see why there was none upon the earth that could speak to my condition, namely that I might give him all the glory mm -hmm. for all are uh, concluded under sin and shut up in unbelief as I had been, that Jesus Christ may have the preeminence who enlightens and gives grace and faith and power. Thus, when God doth work, who shall let uh, hinder it? Um, and this I knew experimentally. Um, and this is sort of where George Fox sort of first has this leading that I think becomes really crucial. Um, yeah. I, I found it so so very beautiful and moving. Um, at the same time, too, I, I, I also am so drawn to what Chip said and really trying to see God in the speaking and working of other people um, mm -hmm. that I'd also maybe want to see or want, I want to, I hope to see the working of Christ in those other preachers, maybe even in the, you know, hopefully not uh, the the traditions of those who uh, were worshiping in Cambridge and Oxford, um, doing things like the liturgical year. Um, so yeah, yeah, I'm not sure what to make of that, um, that sort of inward turn there. Um, If, I just, if anyone has any further thoughts, I feel like we should probably at this point sort of maybe take a little break before meeting for worship. Um, but anyway, I, I really appreciate you all sharing this morning with me and uh, with, with each other. It, it was really some really deep and beautiful things, I feel like. So thank you. Thank, thank you, James. Yep. Thanks, all. <laughs>